I was going to ask this a line in your memoir where you say, I tend to whistle when I'm nervous, and I wondered whether you whistled when you first tried this stage. <laughs> <laughs> whistled a lot. A lot of pacing up and down and whistling, yeah. Did you think long and hard before? Yes. This, this uh, concert that I'm bringing to the, the London uh, Dome in May is actually one that I did uh, last year. I did five performances of it, and to my delight, it became a real joy. A wonderful team, beautiful music, wonderful orchestra, and uh, um, huge orchestra. And, and here it will be the Royal Philharmonic, which is, you know, 82 mu musicians, and it's, it's, it's a thrill. Um, yeah, to, we worked at it very, very hard. We tried to make it a really good evening, and I think we, we succeeded. Because it would have been a while, I think, when you'd been on stage and sung. Oh, certainly. And honestly, Nick, I, I have to sort of um, swim out to the wave and say, I don't think people should expect that I'm going to sing the way I did sing. I think a lot of people mistakenly feel that I'm making this giant comeback concert. It's not exactly that, but it is a really special evening in many ways. I don't sing the way I used to, especially after my throat surgery. I can't. But I can sing, speak. I do have some bass notes that I discovered, and I do have just a couple of tricks up my sleeve, which I think will surprise people. I mean, you famously, I mean, the adjective is probably wrong, but it was a freakish four octave range. Yes, it was when I was a kid, yes. Um, when I was 12 years old and made my debut, it was f uh, four or five octaves, I think, and uh, I could, you know, the dogs would howl for miles around when I did my scales and things like that. And uh, I don't know, it, um, it was a child's voice. It was very pure, very white, full of, you know, I could do any, all the gymnastics. But then as I got older and matured, it, it matured and shifted gear a little bit. So, and I mean, it's a, it's a crass question, but what remains? Very little, to be honest with you, very little. And I wouldn't call it a pure voice by any means. But uh, if I chose to turn to something like singing some jazz or something like that. It might be rather pretty and smoky, but, but I'm not good at that, and, and I know I'm known for the, the more glorious um, ballads and things. So, no, I'm not singing the way I used to, but I am contributing a lot of lovely music with five guest stars. There's a lot of filmed footage um, of me and things that I've done. There's a lot of storytelling by me and anecdotes. I host the evening. And it's called The Gift of Music. And it's really gifts old and new. And it is, um, the first half is all the beautiful music of Rodgers and Hammerstein, who wrote um, Sound of Music and South Pacific and Oklahoma and uh, Carousel and many others. And it, the first half of the evening is the, the gifts of Rodgers and Hammerstein as they relate to me, because I worked with them and did their music quite a lot. Um, the second half of the evening is the new gift, which is actually a gift to me as well as to the audience, and it is an adaptation of a children's book that I wrote with my daughter, Emma. Simeon's Gift. Simeon's Gift. And it is about a minstrel. It's about music and about a musician who sets out to find his uh, muse, his talent, and so on, to, to gain knowledge. And it's exquisitely written. It's, the songs are beautiful. I narrate the piece much like you'd narrate something like Peter and the Wolf. And symphonically, it is so pretty. Um, I know you, you try a solo song. I know you do. Well, how did you know that? <laughs> I read a review. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, if I'm up to it, I do, yeah. If I feel like it, I don't announce that I'm going to do it. But if I can, I just do it. So it's decided on the night, is it? Yes, it is, yeah. But I, uh, having said that, I do, I do join and contribute and sing, speak, in a way, a lot of things. Uh, I don't think people will be disappointed. Well, I've heard on the internet, as you're aware, the way things work these days, everything gets out. Everything's on the internet these days, it's true. So yeah. you, there is a version of you singing, Rogers and Hart. My wonderful, my funny Valentine. Ah, it's a beautiful song. It is beautiful. Yeah, uh, well, when I can, I do it. And um, it's in the range that I can employ right now. I do have some bass notes, you see. 
So anything that's, I mean, uh, I can do a tremendous version of Old Man River if you want me to. <laughs> I'd love you to. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's just a new uh, adventure for me, and in a way, it's a pleasure to, uh, first of all, I never thought I would be uh, even performing with a symphony orchestra again, and to have this gift given back to me is um, not the discovery of another voice or anything like that, but to be able to have written something and suddenly have it be developed into a symphonic piece that I can be a part of was a huge gift to me, and it is so pretty. In your book, in your memoir, Home, um, you have these various descriptions of singing, one of which is it's addictive like opium, it's like sex before the moment of climax. Yes. And now? And now it's warm, glowing. It's, uh, if you really want it, it's, it's that moment after sex when you say, ah, oh, great. And uh, it's filled with joy and wonderful memories. A lot of hard work along the way. Those are some of the memories. But truly, um, I'm very grateful that I was able to sing. I'm hugely grateful that I'm able to present this concert. Uh, and I'm so busy these days. My daughter said to me, Mom, you've just found a different way of using your voice, which in a way is what the, um, uh, the voice that I employ when I write my children's books, and we've done many together. And uh, I get kind of ticked off when people say, oh, she's a celebrity author, you know. And um, I've been writing books now for 35, 38 years, I think. The great Wang Doodle. The great Wang, yes, the last of the really great Wang Doodles. Yeah. My gosh, you've done your homework, Nick. Yeah. That's my job. Yes. Well, you. How do you find time to do that, though, when you're less, busy less traveling? Time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask. What was, I don't know where you played it first. Did you play at the Hollywood Bowl first? Uh, no, we we some did the Hollywood Bowl somewhere in the middle. I think we opened in Louisville. We then did the Hollywood Bowl. No. Well, anyway, we did Atlanta, we did Philadelphia, and um, all of them were wonderful evenings. But do you, do you rem I mean, so again, it's a silly question, but you know, you, you know, the loss of your vocal cords, the loss of your singing voice, and then you, I, I assume one always wants to return to the stage. Well, uh, certainly one wants to be able to sing. One always does if you've loved it and enjoyed g the giving of the music. I think, I think I do speak about that in my book. Something that I grew to so enjoy as I got older was the giving of the, 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 the loveliness of songs. Um, I will always miss that, always. But um, it was 14 years ago that I had my operation, and I've had a long time to muse on it, and thank God it happened later in my career and not at the beginning of my career. Uh, and... Um, I think people mistakenly think that I'm doing this huge comeback concert with restored vocal cords. There was some erroneous uh, um, uh, news about the fact that I was going to have vocal surgery again to restore my voice. Well, I am sponsoring and helping to sponsor, speaking for, uh, some fabulous people in, in the States who are working on vocal restoration, but it's not probably going to be ready in time to help me. It's um, about four or five years away at least. And then I won't be singing anymore, <laughs> I don't think. These are the, this is the guy at MIT, is it? Uh, well, it's, a, it's um, the gentleman at MIT, uh, Dr. Langer, is a phenomenal scientist. He's the one that's working on the, on the stuff, as we call it. But the actual um, uh, uh, wonderful surgeon uh, who has been uh, who it has conceived the idea and is working with him is also out of Boston. Um, and who is he? He is um, Stephen Zytels, Dr. Stephen Zytels. He's brilliant, and his work is phenomenal. But you've talked to them? They've looked at your vocal cords? Oh, sure, yes, yeah. And what did they tell you? Well, if I backed off a little bit, Nick, and said I'm not really supposed to talk about it too much. And since it did happen 14 years ago, suffice it to say that, unfortunately, the whatever surgery, what surgery I had, not by Dr. Zytel's, I must, must add, 
uh, was watched. And so it unfortunately did a damage that's irreparable, seemingly irreparable. But they, again, one never trusts anything one reads on the internet or on the, yes. on the paper. Yeah. There is a sense that there was supposed to be some kind of gel. Yes, and that's the, as we say, it's the stuff that they're working on, but it probably isn't going to be ready. I mean, they haven't even got um, FDA approval. They haven't uh, done all the proper um, trials for it yet. It's a long, long way off, and people, I think, mistakenly thought it was going to happen tomorrow, and it's Did not. you? No, no, no. I've always known that it was uh, um, a long way off, and that all I would do would be to promote and sponsor it, because it's not... It's not just me that's going to benefit from this. People with um, cancer and terrible damage to their cords, people, uh, orators, um, teachers, um, the p members of the clergy. I mean, anybody who uses their voices so much could use good vocal restoration. And this could be, I'm not saying it will be, but it has the potential to be quite an amazing pioneering thing. I'm going to ask you a couple of things about the old days. One stage you auditioned for Richard Rogers. Mm, I talk about that on the program. And what, what, what memory do you have of that? Oh, well, I'll, talk, I'll tell it the night that I do my concert, but I do remember that I sang for him. I was auditioning for um, a show that he wrote called Pipe Dream, and uh, he asked me if I'd, after I sang my aria and belted it out, he asked me if I'd been auditioning for anything else. And I brightly said something like, uh, oh, yes, I'm, I've been uh, sing I sang for two gentlemen who are adapting George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion for the stage. And um, uh, I think they're trying to make a musical out of it, I said. And uh, <laughs> he said, he looked at me and he said, you know, if they ask you to do it, you should take it. If they don't ask you to do it, you should let me know because we'd love to use you. I took his advice and I did My Fair Lady. So generous, though. Extremely generous. And subsequently, Rogers and Hammerstein wrote Cinderella for me after that. And uh, that's something that I talk about, too. Rogers and Hammerstein, um, are they a lead apart? Yes, there are several giants of Broadway, but they are among the gentle giants, the great giants. Uh, that uh, for which we rem remember those magnificent musicals on Broadway. There's Bach and Harnick who wrote Fiddler on the Roof and Fiorello and many others. There's Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe who wrote My Fair Lady and Brigadoon and Camelot. But I'd say in terms of the pioneering, in terms of the body of work, in terms of the melodies, the waltzes that Rogers wrote. I mean, Rogers had a career with, with Hart long before he, he teamed with... Uh, Oscar Hammerstein. So uh, his career was vast, and he was his his work is extraordinary. Okay, well, we're almost done. Two things. When you come back to London, I, I, I always kind of think when you come to a hotel like this, you're you're, you're only a quarter of a mile from the London Palladium, where I think you were in Panto and Cinderella. I was, yes, and I actually did. Um, I, I I debuted my um, uh, act that I later took to. Um, Vegas at the Palladium, too, at, at one point, yeah. But I was about uh, 17 when I did Cinderella at the Palladium. Yes, I'm not too far away. Panto. Panto, yeah. Tons of it, all over England for years and years and years. I played the egg in Humpty Dumpty. I did. I did um, Princess Bedroulbador or something like that in Aladdin. Um, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, Cinderella, of course, at the Palladium, which was probably which was a tremendous help because it was the thing that spurred my going to New York. And My Fair Lady, which you played it obviously in New York and played there for two years, but you brought back to Dury Lane. For another 18 months, yeah. I was in Fair Lady for about three and a half years, which is a real endurance test, especially a big musical like that, eight performances a week. It, that's tough, and I, I still don't know how some of the people do it that, that continue to work in the theatre that way. So when you come back to London, do you revisit that in terms of memory? Or is it just <laughs> tons like of memories. I mean, um, tons of memories, wonderful memories, childhood memories, uh, memories of my family and um, coming up to London from Walton, where I was born. Um, we flew into um, Heathrow yesterday and we flew over Windsor Castle and there it was, right beneath the aeroplane. And I 
look down. It's looking so immaculate and beautiful right now. And uh, just happy memories of Windsor and uh, uh, the places around it, which is very close to where I was born. What do you know about the O2? I know that the sound at the O2 is phenomenal. I know that it holds about, be still my heart, 15,000 people. And uh, I hope that our lovely show will satisfy and fill that vast arena. I think it will. But uh, I also know that it's going to be very daunting, but a challenge to. A final question. Madame, who taught you for 15 years around the corner in the studio in Hanover School. Yes, Madame Styles Allen, my wonderful singing teacher. What would she advise you? To do? <laughs> I know what she'd say. Um, first of all, she'd say, I, c I can bring your voice back for you, Julia. I know I can. Dear, darling, madam, I don't think you could. But sh she'd actually say more than anything, hang on to your words, Julie. And in fact, for me, much as I love the singing and the making of sound, it is the words that I present that are the first, uh, of the first importance for me. I cannot sing a song that has a foolish lyric. I, I once tried to sing a song with no disrespect to the composer, because it's a lovely theme. I once tried to sing a song called Feelings. Do you know it? And it goes, you know, feelings, oh, whoa, whoa, feelings. I was hopeless at singing that song because it didn't have a story. It didn't have a message. I couldn't wrap my brain around the, the giving of it. And uh, so I love good lyrics. And in fact, I just, um, uh, with my daughter, we just have a book out at the moment, which is on the children's bestseller list in, in uh, America. And it is poems, songs, and lullabies. I use a lot of the great lyrics from some of the great songs, because they are poems. Thank you, Nate. Nice talking to you.